Take it three. I'm going for the St. Louis now. Oh, no. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> you get your two? <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to the channel everyone, Fotgor here of course. Today we're going to do another historical video and we are going to be looking at the German cruiser Emden. Now this of course is a premium cruiser, it was given over the holidays, uh, they gave some cool little challenges to um, you know complete in order to unlock the, uh, the ship here and she's a pretty great cruiser at tier 2, I enjoy her anyway. So we're going to talk about the Emden here, um, more importantly though we'll, we'll take a look at like the historical background and what she did in World War 1 and while this is all happening we're going to take a look at some battles I had um, with her while questing for some pearls of course. So the Emden was laid down in 1906 at the Imperial Dockyard in Danzig. She was launched in 1908 and was completed in 1909. Now the majority of the ship's service was with the German East Asia Squadron. Um, this was based out of Tsing Tao in China. So I apologize about my pronunciation there. Um, but anyway, uh, based out of Tsing Tao in China, and then in 1913, a gentleman came along by the name of Karl von Müller. Now he took control of the Emden, Emden as her captain and served as the captain until World War I broke out. Now the Emden saw a number of actions during the early stages of uh, World War I. Most notably um, was her raid on a Russian steamer and then converting that Russian steamer into a commerce raider for the area, uh, which was you know quite handy for the Germans to have, especially over there in the East in, in East Asia. Now as some of you may know, Back in uh, back in Europe, you know, Britain and Germany are facing off. They've got their two fleets basically stalemating each other, right? So the Germans need to bring back a lot of their uh, ships from their far-flung empire because at this stage in world history, Germany does have um, not obviously doesn't compete with the British Empire, right, and its overseas power at the time, but it does have some overseas colonies and overseas squadrons and, and such like that. So they're starting to call these ships back to group them up back in home waters uh, for the potential or what everyone thought was going to happen, right, the two, the, the, big, the big clash between the German high sea fleet and the British home fleet, which as we know never actually happened. Uh, well, you know, sort of happened, I guess you could say with Jutland, but um, wasn't how they envisioned it. Anyway, anyway. So those ships are going back to Germany, German East Asia fleet is leaving the area and has decided to leave the Edmund behind. Um, you, you know, and have her just operate independently as a merchant raider in the area, just disrupting British merchant shipping, doing whatever she can, right? So this was decided. Now in October of 1914, operating independently, the Edmund decided to raid the port of Penang, or Penang. Anyway, using a dummy fourth funnel stack. So yes, when you look at the Ed Edmund here in the game, you know she has four stacks on her. Well, look at the fourth stack. It's actually fake. The reason why the, that stack is fake, um, you can see it here as well, but the reason why the stack is fake is the, the Germans put it on the Edmund to disguise a ship, to make it look like a British light cruiser. So when they were attacking this specific port, uh, the you know the coastal batteries and the defenses of the port you know they might catch them off guard and they were doing this at night as well during the battle uh, of this port the Russians or sorry <laughs> the Germans did manage to sink a Russian cruiser and a French destroyer once the port was taken and the battle was over Muller then decided to take the Edmund to the Cocos Islands and at the Cocos Islands the British had some facilities right there was um, I think they had oil stockpiled there anyway because basically the geography where the Cocos Islands is it's just off of India right and it, it's at that time you know good for the shipping lanes and just world uh, commerce so it was centrally located and served well for the British so you know Muller decided to take the Edmund over there and raid the island so Edmund sent or sorry Muller sent us ashore a raiding party um, and then the raiding party was obviously to take the British facilities right disrupt them set up uh, a German presence on the island now unfortunately for the Edmund, Emden and her crew off the uh, horizon came the HMAS Sydney now the HMAS Sydney was the most powerful ship that the Australians had at this time um, in world, during World War One. It was a cruiser, so she showed up off the horizon and quickly forced the Emden into a battle. The Emden and the Sydney fought it out 
um, for a number of hours, but eventually the Sydney just did so much damage to the Edmund that the Edmund was forced to ground herself in order to prevent her from sinking. Of the crew of 376 men, 133 were killed in battle. Now the shore party aboard, or that was sent to Direction Island, was watching all of this take place. The shore party was led by um, a lieutenant. His name was, uh, what is it, Helmuth von Mucke. M-U-C-K-E. I apologize about my German pronunciations. They're not great. So it was led by this individual. Now seeing what was taking place between the uh, Emden and the HMS, or HMAS Sydney, he immediately started to order, um, you know, building up some fortifications, something, you know, right, expecting a landing party to come ashore and take the, the, uh, the German soldiers out, or the German landing party out. Unbeknownst to the uh, HMS or HMAS Sydney, uh, they didn't know that there was a landing party uh, on Direction Island, so they just, you know, picked up the survivors of the Edmund and took off, right? Left the area. So the, 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 the raid that the, the landing party was expecting never actually took place, and instead what happened is the Germans, uh, you know, declared military martial law on the island, uh, there was one schooner, it was a three-mast schooner docked at Direction Island as well, that the Germans commandeered and their intention was to take this schooner and sail out to the Dutch East Indies. With the, with the, you know, the willing help of the local population of the island, they loaded up the schooner with as much supplies as it could carry um, and took half of the food stock from the island as well to, get, to bring with them to the Dutch East Indies. Now it's important to talk a little bit about the schooner that these guys were on because this really became their home for a number of months. So like I said, it was a three-mast schooner, um, but it was actually rotting. It was really, really old. You know, she had sails. Um, at this point in time in history, we're talking 1914 here, um, you know, there, there are still sail ships out there. So this was a sail ship. Um, you know, well past her service date. This ship had seen her day and it has been passed. So this is what the Germans have to work with here. It's not, you know, just a luxury little schooner. I wanted to make sure that that was clear. You know, she's rotting. Um, it's, it's not a good situation. But anyway, anyway, the Germans did load up supplies, like I say, with the willing help of the local populace, because obviously they want the Germans to leave <laughs> as much as the Germans want to leave, right? They just want to get back home. Uh, so anyway, they leave. They managed to get this schooner um, out of the lagoon. They had to use the, the steam... Uh, shore boats that they, you know, took ashore from the uh, Emden and, and used those steamships to haul out the, the schooner. The schooner's name was the Aisha, I believe. I get A-Y-E-S-H-A. Again, my pronunciation is terrible, I know. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, used the, the, those steamboats to haul her out into open waters, get on her, and they sailed off. They did actually manage to make it to the Dutch East Indies. Uh, they arrived on December 27th, 1914. Now the Dutch government obviously wanted to remain neutral, so they imposed strict, uh, strict restrictions on the Germans while they were in port. And in addition to this, the Germans caught wind that the Dutch government was planning on seizing the vessel. Um, and the Germans didn't want this. They wanted to control their own, you know, sort of fate, their own way to get home. So th then on December 28th, the next day, they decided to leave. Now, they did manage to send off a signal before they left, send word uh, to some German merchant vessels who were in the area. So they left the port, the Dutch East Indies port, and they ended up meeting up with some German merchant vessels. Um, they boarded these German merchant vessels and said goodbye to their uh, three-mast schooner. And it was at this point, um, too, that, you know, some of the sailors uh, did feel a little remorseful about abandoning the ship like that because, I mean, they were on that ship for quite some time. Anyway, anyway, um, the German merchant vessels did then take the landing party to the port of Hodea, and they landed here January 9th, 1915. So after delays and trickery from local population, the landing party hired two barges to eventually take them up the coast. Uh, this was March 14th. 1915. They boarded these barges and decided they were just going to go up the coasts or, uh, you know, bypass all this local population. Because essentially what was happening here 
is that you gotta, you know, first take a look at the history and the time frame, right? So the Ottoman Empire no longer exists, right? They fractured and broke apart. You've got Turkey and you've got the remnants of the Ottoman Empire, uh, different tribes and whatnot. They're all sort of fighting amongst each other right now. So these local population uh, individuals, they see a bunch of German soldiers and they want to use these German soldiers to help them fight their own private little wars. Um, you know, because at this point in time, you know, they're still sort of establishing countries. Um, or you know forming some sort of independence at least attempting to and they want to use the German soldiers to help them accomplish that so the Germans are on the barges to avoid this <laughs> they, they don't want any part of this right they figure their war is over their mission is to get home they just want to go back to Germany uh, so they get on these barges they're sailing off the coast and unfortunately three days after leaving one of the barges hits a reef and sinks fortunately though for the Germans no loss of life with the sinking. Now the landing party then makes it to Al Quanfuda, where a larger boat was hired uh, and then took them to Al Lif. Now when they arrived at Al Lif, the landing party then had to head over land. So now you have you know them walking through the desert uh, to get to Jeddah. Uh, J-E-D-D-A-H, so Jeddah, that's how I'm going to pronounce it. Now once they, now the plan here, once you know they get to Jeddah was to board a train. The Germans though were given the benefit at Al Lif of having a Turkish and Arab guard um, reinforcements basically added to their party. So all of these guys took off towards Jeddah, but unfortunately they were forced into fighting running battles against different raiders as they were going in and out of different you know, territorial claims by these raiders or the local population who is you know, fighting their own independent war type thing. Fortunately for the Germans, a relief force was sent from Jeddah to meet up with the landing party and together with the relief force they all made it to Jeddah. Once at Jeddah, they boarded another barge and then made their way to Al Waja, and they arrived here now. Al Waja, so A L W A J H. So they arrive here, April 29th, 1915. Here they are finally able to board a train, which takes them to Constantinople. So on May 23rd, 1915, seven months since the raid on Penyang, von Mukul reports to the German admiral stationed there. From there, the German sailors get back to Germany. What a story. There are a number of movies made about this adventure as well. And I know that I, you know, briefly, briefly went over it here. Uh, you know, you could talk in a whole lot of depth about this stuff. But I just wanted to bring some sort of light to it, right? Uh, maybe anyone who doesn't know or who didn't know about uh, the Edmund and or Edmund and it's, um, you know, it's pretty epic history and, and especially the landing party didn't know their adventure. At the very least now, I would encourage you guys to take a further look into this. It's really, really is quite something. Um, and even after the German landing party makes it back to Germany, what I found so interesting was that the majority of the officers, sailors, non-commissioned officers who were part of the landing party, part of all of that struggle, they had no interest, no interest whatsoever in partaking in World War II. Not at all. Just the sheer struggle of getting back to Germany, that, you know, that was their own personal little war that they had fought and won, and that was enough for them. It really is quite a story and makes total sense as to why Wargaming would want to bring the ship in um, you know as a premium ship and, and give it away at that as well right um, I mean the ship was given away I hope you all took the opportunity to get one it is a great tier 2 cruiser I was really surprised with the Edmund in fact um, I didn't think I was gonna like it because I figured it would be like an Albany and I, I, I didn't really enjoy the Albany at all um, but this Edmund Emden, sorry, I'm really enjoying. Uh, I think this is a great tier two, um, tier two premium ship, premium cruiser, you know, and, and great, again, you know, good that Wargaming put it in the game because hopefully it inspired some people to actually take a look at the uh, Emden and, and, you know, ask questions. Why is that fourth funnel stack fake? You know, what is that? Or um, what's the story behind it? Um, you know, maybe even just looking up the history of the ship and finding out 
about the um, the battle of the Cocos Island and and you know how that landing party made it to um, all the way back to Germany from there you know over seven months uh, aboard crazy you know crazy ships and barges having to endure crazy hardships um, but eventually making it back really really cool stuff anyway anyway we're not gonna end the video here I figured we may as well let this clip uh, play through to the end right um, so we'll take a look at it we're on big race here um, looking around I do have a what is that South Carolina I'm shooting at not too bad of a target um, to start firing at as well especially considering watch the shells as they come in this guy well and not this guy I mean it's not his fault right it's a South Carolina come on <laughs> but manages you know to fire shots back at me and I, I just dodged them all it was pretty great we've got another cruiser off in the distance that I'm putting shots into as well I think that that was a Diana was it maybe mm, not sure but anyway anyway coming around the headland here and you can see right there there was another enemy battleship but my allies managed to take him out so that was pretty fantastic as well uh, he was burning and going down like no one's business so I'm gonna start putting shots into this enemy cruiser off in the distance here as well just to see if we can't set more fires uh, we pulled out a confederate in the last uh, battle so you know we'll see what we can do about this battle and maybe getting something more uh, but in the meantime like I say putting fire into this guy now obvious reasons I'm firing high explosive at the tier 2 level uh, it just makes sense now there are that that doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't fire armor piercing there there are definitely ships uh, at these lower tiers and situations when armor piercing wrecks face uh, and yeah just obliterates people uh, but for myself you know you know like I said at the beginning of the video here I'm looking for pearls in this battle all I want are kills right I, I want the kills in tier 2 so I can move along and get the pearls for it so I'm just looking to kill people as quick as possible um, a lot of people actually at this time this is when project R just first came out so a lot of people right now are actually doing the exact same thing as I'm doing so there's gonna be a lot of kill steal in here <laughs> um, but that is also you know why we're seeing some more rare cruisers right like the Diana I just killed uh, you don't see that thing very often not often at all I was surprised too that while I was in this battle and while I was doing these tier 2 battles I didn't see many Albanese. No, I think I might have saw one or two. Uh, granted, I assume that most people sold the Albany and it makes sense. I sold mine, <laughs> but um, I did end up hearing from others in the clan. Uh, Garrett, for example, uh, we had him in a few videos, but anyway, he was, I think it was Garrett, who was saying that the Albany was actually quite surprising and it was actually quite a good little tier two, cru tier two cruiser. I'm surprised about it. I mean, I I took it out one battle, I think, the Albany, and yeah, it's probably not the best to uh, judge how the ship is going to perform based on the one battle, but <laughs> I decided it would be best just to sell it and take the port slot. I have no regrets. <laughs> this uh, this poor, unfortunate player over here, um, you know, you can see he's just getting eaten up by all of my allies here. It's a South Carolina. There he goes. He's gone. I I think that's my third kill now, so that's not too bad. We have an enemy destroyer in front of me. It's a Wikitake, so this is a Japanese tier 3 destroyer. Fairly um, deadly at this tier, I find. And it's just because it's like a prelude to the Minikaze, right? It has fairly good uh, detection, or concealment rather. The torpedoes on it, you can't really complain about the torpedoes. Um, you, you can get in there and sneak attack people with them, as long as you're doing it carefully right because you know you've got your detection range and your torpedo range which are fairly similar so got to keep those things in mind uh, but anyway anyway not too bad he he popped some smoke and went away I'm not willing to hunt him down right obviously I'm gonna start firing at whatever other enemies I can find uh, we do still have this enemy uh, Kowachi here Kowachi is a crazy little battleship I found when I first started playing the Kowachi I hated it couldn't stand it it was slow I had to get right in there couldn't engage anyone um, but as I actually got to the end of the Kwachi and she was fully upgraded and I was getting more used to her, I actually enjoyed it. I was really, really surprised. Now, I didn't enjoy it enough to keep it, but I enjoyed it uh, enough that, you know, I didn't move into the Tier 4 angry. <laughs> Anyway, two enemy ships remaining, so we can see the Wikitake is back. We're putting shots into this guy. Um, you know, I'm the cruiser, so I'm going to try and take out the destroyer while my ally ships around me continue to put shots into the Kwachi. Hopefully, they'll take down the Kwachi and I can take down the Wikitake. That is the plan. Now, the Wikitake has sent off torpedoes for me. 
fairly tragic here. Oh, I take one. My repair, I've already used my repair, so now, you know, things aren't going so well. Luckily, I didn't take any flooding. This is the saving grace of all this, but I do have really low health, and don't forget the Kawachi. <laughs> he's still there, right? Uh, so he's still around. This enemy Wicket's is almost dead. If I can just kill him, maybe I'll get myself another kill, which would be fantastic. And then, if, you know, things go well, maybe take a look at the Kawachi as well. Enemy Wikitake goes behind the island. Nothing I can do. I just can't get him anymore. I do still see the enemy Kawashi, right? And I'm fairly close to this guy. Uh, and he's got some pretty big cannons. And I'm on fairly low health. So I'm going to try not to die. But I do want to kill something. I want to kill the Wikitake. So I'm going to try and maneuver around here. Get a few shots off. We have some torpedoes on the way. The Wikitake managed to send them in before he went around the island. Luckily, I was able to dodge those, though. Continue to put shots into the enemy Wikitake. Yeah, there we go. But, <laughs> right, I still managed to kill the Wikitake. <laughs> but the Kawachi got me. Yes, I knew it was going to happen. He was so close, he had to take me out. But at the very least, I took the Wikitake with me. So fantastic. Now it's just a matter of sitting around, watching the battle play out, right? We only have the one Kawachi remaining. Uh, so this is going to end quickly here once my team finishes him off. But getting back to the Emden. Yeah, I really do enjoy this cruiser. I think it's a great cruiser at Tier 2, like I've said. Uh, not only within the game does she perform decently, but from a historical standpoint, I, I, I think it's one of the more interesting ships uh, to take a look at from that era, uh, and mostly because of the landing party. The whole landing party thing is what did it for me. Now, obviously, the, the lone Edmund out there, right, in the Indian Ocean raiding... British uh, merchant vessels, you know, that just inspires uh, heroic and uh, epic, like, scenery and whatnot, right? So it, I can see that as well being really awesome, and that's sort of what drew me into the Edmund at first, but then once I found out about the landing party, that is what just sort of, you know, the cherry on the cake. And like I say, there are a number of movies um, out there about uh, the Edmund, uh, Emden and her landing party, and you guys are more than welcome to take a look at those, uh, watch them through. So the battle is over. We'll take a look at the overall results. So, you know, they're not too bad here. Uh, managed three kills, I think. Yeah, meh. Second overall, not too shabby at all, and I managed to die as well. More importantly, though, you know, just the number of kills to get the pearls. That's what I want. So the video is over. I do thank you very much for sticking around, watching it through. Hopefully you enjoyed the little historical look at the Edmund here, uh, and in here as well. Uh, you know, leave any comments you have for me in the video comment section below. Love reading those and responding back to them. Hit the old like button if you did like today's video. Hit subscribe if you are not a subscriber. And as always, I do hope you enjoy the rest of your day.